Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the Fair Compare Weekly Podcast. My name is Rick Sini. I'm the CEO and co-founder of FairCompare.com. And uh, yesterday, I got a chance to hop on to Good Morning America and chat a little bit about uh, some new data that came out from the Department of Transportation on complaints. And joining me today to talk about uh, those complaints is our editor from the site from California, Ann McDermott. Hey, Ann. Well, fortunately, we never have complaints about flights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not much. Uh, you know, I, last time I looked, I have several million miles on my uh, my account. And uh, I can't, uh, there's some places, like if I go to LA, I can be guaranteed to be delayed at least an hour. It happens every time, probably the last 10 straight times. Delays and cancellations. I've gotten to the point now where I just sort of built in the fact that I think it's going to be a delay. So then I'm super excited when it actually arrives on time. Well, for a while, it looked as though the complaints had been uh, kind of flattened out. They weren't rising much. They weren't dropping much. But now suddenly, uh, and this is over the course of uh, this past June compared to the June of 2014, they they jumped nearly 50 percent. I mean, that's that's significant. Yeah, you know, there was a couple things, you know, because of my math background, I had to look through the data a little bit tighter. Certainly Spirit Airlines hadn't been in the previous report. So that and Spirit, by the way, is up there with uh, United American and the total number of complaints. And I think that has to do with their business model. And, the, you know, that first time you fly, you don't realize how many different uh, fees you're going to pay. Although, if you know ahead of time, a lot of people love that. So if you just it's just knowing what you get. I think that's where you see some of the complaints there. That's a rise there. I thought it was interesting too that um, you know uh, both Southwest and Delta swam under the radar. Now we got to remember this report. It's not that easy to complain if you try to go and say how do I complain to the Department of Transportation um, and type that into Google. You're not going to find the exact spot <laughs> where to complain. Uh, you know most of your complaints come through email, uh, phone calls, and then some of them through online if you know where to do it. We have it posted along with our article. So you'll you'll be able to complain if you'd like uh, there. And by the way, these complaints make a big deal. They made it on the national media uh, yesterday. Senators get on board with it. Um, you know, they're looking at it. They like to get on TV with those particular issues and, and try to, um, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, force some change in that area. So airlines are well aware that um, these statistics matter. It would be interesting to see what airlines think about the complaint rate, because I keep thinking back to what Ben Bell, Baldonzo, I believe that's his name, the CEO of Spirit, Spirit Airlines, Airlines said yeah. one time when he was criticized by some fellow and he said, oh, he'll be back the minute uh, we save him a penny. And there's something to that, isn't there? I think there is. I think it's that same sort of philosophy. We've seen it over the last 30 years with things like Walmart, right? So you have a small mm. city. In comes a, you know, in my case, when I was little, it was Gibson's on the outside of town, which was sort of the big store or a Walmart. You say, look, I'm going to go to that dress store. I'm going to go to that 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 place. And then you then you realize that you go outside of town just to get a couple things, but they're cheaper there, even though you want to you know, sort of support your inner city and your inner downtown. You end up going where the cheap stuff is. Well, it, it will be interesting to see. I mean, it, it, but it, as you pointed out, if you want to make a complaint and these complaints we're talking about were made to the Department of Transportation, you might want to start with your airline and then, you know, like work your way to the federal government if you get no satisfaction or don't get a response. But it, it, it is partly the responsibility of the flyer to know the rules of the airlines, to know that the cheapest sure. fares are not refundable. And when they say not refundable, they mean they're not going to give you money back <laughs> no matter I noticed, what. Yeah, I noticed the most complaint about fares with Southwest, and I can tell you what those complaints are, right? Somebody goes to, they see on TV, $49. So everybody goes, well, good, I can fly anytime I want for $49. <laughs> they, they go search for a Monday to a Friday or a Friday to Sunday and it's $650 and they're going, what happened to the $49? And uh, so they're, the fine print, you know, they do, you know, on radio commercials, they say it very quickly at the bottom. Uh, on, on ads, you see it at the bottom. Maybe it's only good Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, for example. Or sometimes people miss just the one simple word from these, this sale <laughs> from, is from $73 one that's, way or 49 or whatever. 
Yeah, but you that low number, that's what you're looking for, right? You're saying, oh, great, I can go anywhere I want for $49. Doesn't matter if it's I'm living in Dallas and I want to go to Austin or if I want to go to New York. That's just how people think, right? They see 49 and they're good to go. Well, as you pointed out, if you just uh, look for, uh, on Fair Compare on our site, we do have the information. We can tell you how to file a, a complaint for an airline, how to file a complaint with the federal government, the Department of Transportation, and how to file various complaints with airport security, the TSA. So, you know, drop by if, if anything goes wrong, but we hope it doesn't. Yeah, we hope it doesn't. And by the way, these statistics are very small. I mean, we're talking about single digit thousands when two million passengers fly a day. So uh, while it's a small sample, it's one that certainly makes the media. So that's a good thing, right? So your vote or your complaint will definitely be registered and somebody will hear it at least, uh, you know, every now and then. So uh, get out there. Hopefully you'll fly and you won't have these issues. In general, you know, the funny thing, Ann, is, is that because there's less check bags, there's less issue with mishandled bags. We've seen those rates go down, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, for, in the case of on-time arrivals, sometimes that's a lot of that t- has to do with Mother Nature and what month that happens right. to happen in some of those statistics. And then the question is, what? how do airlines handle the aftermath of that, right? So do they... Do they actually refund your ticket quickly? Do you get your refund quickly? Or does it take three months or four months to get your refund? And, and a variety of those. And that I think that's where we'll see the complaints continue to come. Hopefully, you know, we'll see those statistics drop because really flying is, is really fun. But the best part of it is seeing the airport in your rearview mirror. Well, and as you point out, the best part is is getting to your destination or going home. But if you are on your destination, there's uh, something of a debate about cash versus credit cards, debit cards. How do you work it? How do you pay for stuff when you're on a trip? Yeah, no, I always, always try to use the credit card if I can. So here's what I normally do when I take a trip. So if it's international, um, I have a little stash at my house that has 20 euros, 20 pounds, <laughs> whatever the currency is. I always put that in my wallet, right? So as soon as we land, I look for an ATM. So uh, while well, ahead of time, too, on my on my app, I have, in my case, uh well, I won't even say the bank, uh, a couple of different banks and I'll go on there and you can say I'm going out of the country. Right. And it'll that way it'll know when I get there. It's not it's not going to have any issue. Also, the credit card companies, if I'm going to use a couple of credit cards, I'll do that ahead of time. Then I go through AT&T and make sure I have the international data plan for data roaming and all the other things set right. up. All you can do that on your phone. And then when you hit the airport, find an ATM. And usually I get $100 or a couple hundred dollars in whatever the currency is. I just got back from France recently. So I've, I still have, in fact, if you look in my wallet here, I still have, uh, let's see, 10 euros here. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's, uh, one thing I wanted to throw out, uh, the important point you made to tell your bank, your credit card folks that you're going to be out of town, because otherwise you'll be constantly pestered with these demands for, you know, what the heck are you doing having this uh, spending spree in Italy? Who has your card? And they might even cancel it or, you know, put a stop on it. You don't want that when you're out of town. And the uh, the phone thing, you you want to take care of uh, roaming charges, get yourself a plan, you know, that's a finite charge for Europe, if Europe's where you're going or South America, wherever, because you don't want to come home and get a bill for thousands of dollars. It happens. Oh, no, it happens all the time. And it, all it takes is once. <laughs> it's a tough, yes, that's it's a all tough it thing takes. to learn. And uh, well, you know, the interesting thing was, is that the, I actually had end up sitting next to somebody because of a snafu on the plane. Uh, apparently, the um, air marshal had taken my seat. I found out after the fact. Um, so I ended up sitting next to somebody and, and they had been at, they had told because of the Greece crisis and everybody was sort of freaked out about money and whether or not you could go to ATM and whatnot. He had brought a lot of cash with him, which is really not a good idea. And he actually disclosed it to, they had a bunch of uh, um, uh, customs officials there on this particular fly boarding with a dog, which is unusual. Um, and so he got, you know, carted off to the side. They were looking at his cash. But, you know, when you get there, exchanging that cash is terrible exchange rates. That's why I like to use the ATM because you're getting sort of natural exchange rates, not these, you know, five, seven, eight percent exchange rates that you see, you know, along the street as you're visiting. Okay. Or at so, the airport. Uh, you're saying go through official channels or, or like 
you know, reputable banks. Uh, yeah, you know, but the problem is you get to the airport and then they have, you know, dozens of different ways where you can cash your money, but the, it's going to, they're going to charge you, gosh, anywhere from four to 8% to do that, right? So they give you a really bad exchange rate. So if you're doing it from the ATM, you get the official exchange rate at that time that you made the transaction, much better deal for you. The other thing that I do too is I make sure I always take my credit card that I use that doesn't have foreign transaction fees. So you get home and you've made 20 or 30 transaction fees, they charge two, three or percent. There's many cards out there that basically waive foreign transaction fees as well. Well, that's good to know. Well, speaking of foreign transactions, boy, that's, this is going to be a very weak segue, as you will see. <laughs> Let's talk about people in the U.S. military and veterans and discount flights and travel tips. Um, I think it, we're seeing more and more of this. At least it's getting more and more publicity that, you know, people in uniform are getting uh, certain perks because, uh, you know, the airlines and others are recognizing right. their service. Um but it's not always that obvious. I, I think the key here is you got to ask. Right. So military personnel for official business have to transact all their transactions through a government based system. There's actually two or three things that they actually buy and then their city pair gets bid. In fact, we wrote some software about 10 years ago as part of that, uh, where they bid each, uh, where we were doing competitive intelligence on these bids. So airlines actually bid for those routes. Here's the problem. That doesn't ha that doesn't include spouses, you know, significant others, whatever, those other things. And so they basically are buying to, for the most part, um, on the free market, just like everybody else is. They don't have any special uh, discounts necessarily. Remember, we don't have senior discounts anymore, pretty right. much. There's, I mean, no they bereavement have them, but there fares. Are, yeah, bereavement fares, military discounts. Now, uh, I love the fact that when, we, when they board aircraft, they let the military, you know, um, uniform military personnel board first. I think that's always a cool thing. And in fact, I, in some cases, I've actually given up when I've been upgraded a few times seats uh, when I found out that certain military folks, because I just think it's it's awesome that they're, they're, you know, to have a plane and, you know, have them clap. And, you know, when they announce, you know, I know on Southwest Airlines, a lot of times they'll think, hey, we have three or four military personnel on board, um, all cool sort of perks. And, and I really think that that's, that's a neat thing. Now, as far as buying tickets first. Um, they do have, in some cases, some airlines, they do have some military discounts. They have the Armed Forces Vacation Club. So they have mm -hmm. several clubs, uh, you know, related to Armed Forces. Um, and, and really, it, it's about comparing fares, right? So Always. they also, yeah. And then, then there's some perks as well, as far as checking bags. I know there was a big row about this four or five years ago, yep. where some, some military personnel were charged extra for second, third, and fourth check bags. So most of them have a policy to allow that to to happen at no cost. I know American, Delta, Southwest, United all have policies in that area. That's about 80% of the traffic. I think all the other airlines do as well. And there are, uh, some of these airlines will extend these courtesies, the, the extra free bags to families. And uh, sure. some airlines will actually uh, allow military service people and uh, I believe their dependents, but you always have to check uh, into their you know, VIP clubs, their lounges, which can be a very nice experience. And one day I hope to have that very nice experience, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it always pays to ask. You, you know, you don't get anything if you don't. Yeah, just do a little bit of research. And, you know, it's always fun for me. I take lots of questions when I do call in shows about how uh, to get to visit certain military destinations. And we're always looking for how uh, to have the best discounts. So, again, um, lots of perks out there. You have to ask. Come to our site. We're tracking it. We think this is a great storyline. And uh, so just check it out here on Fair Compare. Well, you mentioned uh, the free bags that they get. And uh, we don't get free bags unless we fly Southwest. But uh, yeah, not no, as Jet, Jet Blue, Jet Blue bit the dust recently. I can't. I can't. Well, I can, but you know, it makes me sad. I sure did. Well, I do like Jet Blue. 
I like them all. I like I like who's it for going I my way. I actually like all for the-, the airlines, and I've flown. I think I can't remember now over fifty five different um, airlines. Some of them do, some of them don't exist anymore. I actually have a little board in my house. If I fl- so you know, recently I went to Spain, so I f- I flew Boiling. Um, so I, I did, always I've flown them, and they were very nice. Very yeah. Nice. So and recently I, I flew on Air Berlin as well. So um, so I try to you know fly almost every airline just to check it out and. and um, so I've, I've got, let's see, about 400 more to go <laughs> worldwide. So I'm not sure I'm going to actually uh, get those airlines. And, and they, they change their names a lot. So, But one of the things that's really important is that we saw a story that came up. I don't know if AP generated it. was a story out of IATA, the International Air Transport Association, that said that worldwide everybody was going to standardize on a certain size of carry-on bag. And by the way, I just got back from – uh, a trip to to Paris and Monaco, um, uh, Monte Carlo, um, with check bags with the family. Own, I mean, with uh, carry on bags only, which is sort of I my knew policy. You were say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and and the question is, what size do you need? And it was funny. All a couple of weeks up until there, you know, you have your 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 carry on, but you also get your second personal bag. My wife kept bringing different bags. Will this one make it past the baggage police? Will this one make it past the baggage police? And internally, when you're flying, for example, in France, you have to you. Have actually have to check your bag unless it's uh, under like 18 pounds or something like that, which is almost impossible. Yeah. Um, so they, they had, so you have to prepay that. So in some cases you do have to check your bag because it's required by the airline, depending on what kind of aircraft you're on. Um, but, you know, I do have two different sizes. Like I'm, I'm going to be heading out on a trip soon. Um, for a carry-on bag. In this case, I'm taking a golf bag. So I tend to stuff a lot of stuff <laughs> in there. You would. Yeah. Uh, and I have sort of the international carry-on size, which is sort of meets the limit. It's a little bit smaller bag. I take that if I'm on a one or two day trip here in the U.S. as well. So, um, you know, really the, the standard in the U.S. is what they call 45 linear inches. Mm-hmm. And that's basically that's width, good. height and depth, right, which is pretty good. There's some airlines that are up to 50. Um, recently, British Airways dropped theirs for their personal size bag down to the into the mid 30s. Um, so um, you have to be aware of the airline. But in general, in the U.S., it's bigger than it is in Europe. So when you're traveling to Europe, just be aware that that your your carry on bag may or not might may not fit their size requirements, which is really around 41 linear inches. And sometimes it doesn't even matter about the size. You're, you're feeling good. You've got your carry on, you board the plane, or you're just about to step on the plane. And they say, oh, we don't have any more room in the bins. We're going to take that and we'll get it right back to you, blah, 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 blah. If that happens to you, you know, there's not, nothing you can do about it, but at least you won't have to pay anything. But open the bag real quick, pull out any medications that you may <laughs> have to bad. have on you. You know, if you stuck your glasses in there, pull out any kind of stuff you, you need. If you're, you know, the, the iPad mini that you were going to while away the airline the airplane trip uh, with, pull that out, you know, and then give it to them. Yeah. So like, I'll, I'll give you an example. This is exactly what you, sh- you know, I had, Basically, my liquids, and I have a backpack that I take the liquids that has my tablet and my speakers and my headphones, I mean, my headphones and a couple charging cords. And that's always on my back, just a little bitty sort of, uh, in my case, it's an Adidas backpack. That's my sort of carry on. So it had, you know, in, in, including my medications in there as well. So um, that's always a good thing to do. I, I've had so many bags lost um, when they do get checked in the, in the past. And it's not about... Um, for me, it's more convenient to do carry on everything. But if you do lose a bag, it is a pain in the butt. You have to deal with, uh, you know, all the process that's required to get that bag back. It may be two or three days later, especially if you're in an international location. So um, anyway, just carry what you need, cash, passports, everything. Never put that in a check bag or a bag that may end up getting checked when you carry it on. There's one more advantage to a carry on and and that's, you know, you can make a much cleaner, quicker getaway from the airport once you finally land. You know, if need be, you can be first in line for the taxi. You don't have to spend all this time watching this carousel go around and around and around without <laughs> your bag. Ugh. It was kind of interesting, too. When I, I just we just got back at DFW Airport a couple of weeks ago. Um, we have global entry, which is something anybody that flies internationally should try to get, which is basically yeah. fast tracking through 
immigration and customs. Uh, but they had an interesting thing. They had a special section over uh, 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 at the immigration area where if you only had a carry on, you could basically get the equivalent of global entry. So I forget what the, the brand name of it was, but uh, by that carry on, you actually we we actually did that because we actually had somebody in our party that didn't have global entry. So we didn't want to leave them hanging in the immigration line. So we all four went through that line and it was basically like global entry. You, you get your picture, you go to the kiosk, hand it to the person, and then you're out the door and into an Uber and home. I think we saved at least two hours. Oh, I, I, I know you told me about that and I looked it up because I wanted to, I think I was thinking about writing a post about how many airports have this. Well, I can tell you how many airports have this. Uno. <laughs> One, it's DFW. Nobody, uh, unless it's going by a different name, but I tried everything and I'm a pretty darn good searcher. It's, it sounds like an idea that, you know, LA, New York, a whole bunch of places really, really need to look into. Yeah, the cool thing about DFW is that all immigration comes into one huge area. Some airports, they have it in a couple different spots. So, again, carry-on bags are the way to go. We, we were able to move through. We actually got a smaller size cars when we were in, uh, oh, in Europe nice. on the way to because we don't have the huge bags. So, we didn't have to pay the extra fee for a Suburban or some sort of larger car because we had a fairly large party. So, tons of advantages of doing carry-on. Also Thanks, good yeah. for traveling on trains. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It's trains, subways, um, you name it. Mm-hmm.